On the line with me is uh, Eamon Fingleton, a, a journalist, uh, economics journalist, former Financial Times and edi uh, uh, former editor at the Financial Times and at Forbes magazine, the author of numerous books, including In the Jaws of the Dragon, uh, a, a, a brilliant book about the rise of China. His articles have appeared in The Atlantic Magazine, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Harvard Business Review. Uh, Eamon Fingleton, it is uh, always a pleasure to have you with us, sir. Welcome back. Uh, Great, great to hear you, Tom. It's been, in fact, it's been too long um, since we've had a good conversation. I'm curious your thoughts on uh, where you know, where this Brexit uh, vote is pro probably going, what the consequences will be in either case, whether I'm, I'm seeing r rumors of a Frexit, that there's, there's talk in France about uh, pulling out of the European Union. Um, uh, is this happening in other countries? Uh, uh, you, want, you want to give us a, a, maybe even just start out with a snapshot for for Americans of what this is all about? Well, uh, it's uh, really hard to know. Um, uh, 500 million people across Europe, uh, it's hard to read their minds. But uh, I think there's a general uh, pulling back from globalism. Uh, you see it very much in the United States with the rise of Trump and to a certain extent uh, Bernie Sanders as well, um, and uh, the um, mindset in Britain uh, clearly has moved um, away from globalism in the last 10 years, so um, the uh, Brexit campaigners are running neck and neck with the Remain people, um, which I don't think anyone 10 years ago would have predicted. Mm-hmm. And, and what, you know, I've read predictions that if the U.K. separates from, from the European Union, uh, there's going to be some sort of economic disaster. And then I've also read that, you know, it actually may cause an increase in wages in the U.K. because it's going to, it's going to force a lot of uh, uh, people in the U.K. from lower-wage European countries to, to go home, basically. Yeah, I, I, I would have thought that the, the pluses and minuses uh, economically balance, uh, balance out. Um, there will be some pluses, some minuses. Um, I, I'd be surprised if um, many uh, existing um, people in the United, United Kingdom, uh, foreigners, would be expected to go home. I think there will be some, um, uh, some effort uh, by... Parliament to um, uh, uh, forestall really drastic uh, effects like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps put into place some sort of work permit or visa, the, the kind of stuff that existed before the EU? Yeah, right. Uh, I, I think the Parliament uh, is uh, going to be uh, uh, on the lookout for um, drastic um, effects and we'll try to minimize them uh, and uh, I, I think that um, if there were a Brexit vote um, uh, today uh, tomorrow nothing would change um, and uh, it would be in the gift of uh, intelligent people to ensure that um, the um, future changes would come in gradually and would not be disruptive right right um, uh, you know, you know it, it struck me that this is, in a way, kind of the ultimate uh, uh, Bucky Fuller in reverse, or has been up until this point. You know, uh, Buckminster Fuller, small is beautiful. Um, uh, inefficiency is can be a good thing. Um, and the argument, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the argument for the European Union um, and, and much of the, the many other dimensions of globalization, including the GATT and the WTO, has been that, you know, big is better. You know, if we can make these things bigger, they become more efficient, they become better, they, they, uh, they, they spin off more profit. Uh, but it seems that the consequence of it has been big is better for the big guys, but not for the little guys. Uh, am I making sense here? Um, I, I, I think that's the general consensus in the UK, that... Uh... Um, the, the small companies have bigger compliance problems relatively in dealing with the, the regulations from Brussels than big companies. Big companies can have a big legal department, compliance department, and it doesn't add much to their 
uh, total costs. Uh, small companies uh, trying to get a reading on what they're supposed to do. That's that's a bigger percentage of their sales. Well, and even beyond compliance, there are there are issues of competition. You know, aren't there? I mean, it's increasingly difficult for small companies to compete um, with large companies when those large companies are not just national but but multinational, supranational. Well, right. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, for small companies, uh, small business owners in the UK. Uh, are tending towards uh, exit, um, and precisely for this reason that they feel that they've got a, a disproportionate burden in terms of uh, the size of their operations uh, in spending on um, regulatory matters. Are, are we looking at the beginning of the end of the of this globalization experiment that arguably sort of started in the in the early 70s with Nixon and China and all that and you know, picked up steam under Reagan, but really went full full tilt boogie in the 90s, you know, with uh, NAFTA and GATT and the WTO. Uh, do you think that we're starting to see the, the disintegration of that consensus? I, 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 I absolutely. I, I think that uh, in ideas as well as in um, clothes, we have uh, fashions, and uh, the fashion in uh, globalization has been running for uh, 40, 50 years, um, and I think now it's um, going back the other way. Um, it's been going back probably for about 10 years. Uh, gra very gradually, people are beginning to realize that there's a downside. Um, uh, terrorism is one um, issue, of course, that has been on people's minds. Um, jobs also. Um, and um, I think people in their uh, 60s, uh, particularly um, in the UK, they remember a time when Britain could um, not only um, survive but do well without being a member of the uh, then the European Economic Community. Um, and um, they um, balance up the pluses and minuses, uh, minuses and say, why do we have to be part of this bigger unit that uh, is impinging on our, our sovereignty? sovereignty? Right. How does the country, uh, we, we have just a minute or so left, uh, we're talking with Eamon Fingleton, how does the country make the, the, the transition? I mean, we're, we're, what we're talking about really is uh, the rise of nationalism. How do we do that in a way that doesn't lead to toxic nationalism? Well, uh, it's a, a, a good uh, uh, question. I, I, I think that um, people do remember the excesses of nationalism in the past, um, and um, uh, communications are so much better now. People understand each other better because they travel more, they talk on the phone to people in other countries uh, all the time. Uh, so in that sense, I think that there will be some check on um, the, the, the trend going too far. Yeah, that seems like a reasonable thing. And the, and the toxic nationalism always seems to have the component of this is our country, and by the way, we're better than anybody else. Or you know, and when it gets really toxic, we're genetically even better than anybody else. And that doesn't seem to be. Although that's being pitched by some on the right, aren't they? Well, I, I think a very small minority uh, on the Brexit side in the UK yeah. um, have um, uh, that there are racist overtones in some of the things they've said. Uh, but I, I think that um, the vast majority of supporters of Brexit are reasonable people. Uh, they're not in the business of hate. They're in the business of just re reclaiming their country and um, going back to status quo before all this happened. Yeah, we'll see where this goes. Hang on just a second here, sir. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Eamon Fingleton is uh, my favorite of his books, In the Jaws of the Dragon. Uh, you can find all his, his other work out there on the internet. Uh, Eamon, thank you so much for being with us. Yep. To watch more clips from our programs, hit the Watch More Videos button over here. And please be sure to hit the handy-dandy subscribe button so you'll always be up to date. Tag, you're it.